from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Puscast, episode 25, recorded on March 29th, 2023. I'm Daniel Griffin, and I'm actually coming to you from New York. And joining me today is Sarah Dong. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Dong. Welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. Sarah, where where are you right now? Uh, I am. I'm home in Boston. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. So I some disturbing news, which maybe we'll get to later, but um, I was chatting with some of my colleagues um, and they showed me, were you ready for this? You okay. can buy dried cordyceps at Whole Foods as an immune booster. Um, <laughs> I'm a little worried. I'm a little worried about that. Well, uh, wow. Well, now I'm going to have to go look it up after we. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, well, podcast is a review of the ID literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. So on to the literature, shall we? All right. Starting with viral. Remember to listen to This Week in Virology, uh, clinical updates for timely viral-related information. Um, I don't know if our listeners know this, but we are really rapidly approaching TWIV 1000. Um, so It is crazy. Actually, we were only in the 500s when, uh, when the COVID pandemic began. So we're in the 500s when... Um, I think the end of February there, I jumped on with Ori uh, and Vincent and uh, started talking about what was to come. And here we are <laughs> um, approaching TWIV 1000. So, all right. A uh, couple articles here that I really enjoyed. Uh, the one, first one, the article blocking NS3 and NS, NS4B interaction inhibits dengue virus in non-human primates, published in Nature. Yeah, I know you're all hooked already. You're on the edge of your seats. Well, this group previously described the interaction between non-structural proteins, that's what that NS stands for, NS3, and non-structural 4B as a promising target for the development of pan-serotype dengue virus inhibitors. Um, I'll also leave a link into a paper that explains the mechanism a little bit better here, that prior paper. But um, here the investigators focus on JNJ, Dash 1802. That's very catchy. They're going to need to rename that. Give me a call. I'll help you. But the JNJ 1802 exerts in vitro antiviral activity, a high barrier to resistance, and potent in vivo efficacy in mice against infection with any of the four um, dengue serotypes. They also demonstrate that the small molecule inhibitor, again, JNJ1802, is highly effective against viral infection uh, with dengue virus 1 or dengue virus 2 in non-human primates. JNJ1802 has also successfully completed a phase 1 first-in-human clinical study in healthy volunteers and is safe and well-tolerated. Um, they actually presented this data at an abstract at ASTM and H. So those of you that joined us, um, now they suggest these investigators, and I agree that these findings support the further clinical development of J&J 1802, a first-in-class antiviral agent against dengue, which is now progressing in clinical studies for the prevention and treatment of dengue. Well, I'm very excited. But why worry about dengue here? We're safely in the U.S. Well, in the recent MMWR, Notes from the Field, first evidence of locally acquired dengue virus infection, Maricopa County, Arizona, November 2022. How come I'm always in these places when things happen? I just got back <laughs> from Arizona. Well, we hear about an interesting report. Here they report a case of dengue identified in a Maricopa County, Arizona resident. Uh, the patient, patient A, was admitted to a hospital in October 19 for a dengue-like illness, seven days after traveling to and remaining in Mexicali, Mexico, for less than four hours. Uh, patient A was hospitalized for three days and subsequently recovered. 
covered, got all better. Maricopa County Environmental Services um, Department, MCESD, conducted retrospective testing for a dengue virus in samples collected from 21 mosquito pools located within five miles, eight kilometers, of patient A's residence during October 1 through November 3rd. A sample collected from one mosquito pool on October 5th, it was positive for the dengue virus. Whole genome sequencing uh, by CDC's dengue branch later revealed that closely related uh, dengue 4, dengue virus 4, th- dengue virus 3 strains not known to be circulating in the patient's travel region were identified in both patient A and pool A, suggesting local dengue transmission. Yeah, that, I read that one too. It's really interesting. And I had no contact. This, I, not me. <laughs> Um, my paper that I have in this section is from OFID, Respiratory Viral Infections and Recipients of Cellular Therapies, a Review of Incidents, Outcomes, Treatment, and Prevention. Uh, so this is a lovely review of, as mentioned in the title, the epidemiology and clinical aspects and management options for respiratory viral infections, uh, specifically in the setting of these adoptive cellular therapies, which many of the people listening probably know, but are salvage therapies or treatments for patients with refractory hematologic disease. So T cells and NK cells that are genetically modified to express chimeric antigen receptor. So all that to say CAR CAR T cell therapy. Um, So the authors found that the incidence of respiratory viral infections after CAR T ranged from 8 to 20% in that first 30-day window after receiving their infusion. They also found poor outcomes and higher mortality in these patients, which I think is uh, not too surprising. They have a really nice outline of the timeline from CAR T cell infusion and phases, uh, which are very similar to the diagrams that people may know of infection timelines after, for example, hematopoietic or solid organ uh, transplants. Um, So that's in figure one. And then table two is a really nice summary of some of the preventative and therapeutic options because in the paper they go uh, virus by virus. And so I think one of the major keys here is to remember that these patients' risk factors are also more than just the impact of their CAR T cell therapy, that many of these patients have had pretty significant exposure to other lines of immunosuppressive therapy. Um, But I also mentioned this to shout out the author Rita on this uh, paper because we do have a febrile episode that we just recorded on ID complications of CAR T cell therapy. So that should be out in May, give or take. It will pair really (laughs) nicely with this paper. (laughs) All right. Yeah, I, I find this a fascinating field. So exciting to uh, exciting to listen. Excited to listen to that Bebrel episode. Yeah. The article, the evolving Japanese encephalitis situation in Australia and implications for travel medicine, um, is exactly that important for travel medicine and travelers. Um, we see here that reporting of locally transmitted human cases of Japanese encephalitis virus in two consecutive summers in southeastern Australia likely reflects establishment of endemic transmission across a large part of subtropical and temperate Australia. Um, Ongoing seasonal transmission is likely being driven by La Nina conditions and increased frequency of extreme weather events driven by climate change. The epidemiological situation is still evolving in Australia, and risk areas may change over time. Um, I think they're going to expand, by the way. In recent decades, documented um, Japanese encephalitis virus transmission has been limited to Asia, Papua New Guinea, and Australia, but the epidemiology of the disease is changing in many areas, including the Pacific Islands, Southern Europe, the United States, and Africa remain receptive due to the presence of competent mosquito vectors, and vertebrate hosts. All right, now we're moving into bacterial. I just was enjoying this week in uh, microbiology, TWIM, so uh, be sure to listen. There's some interesting stuff. They were discussing pseudomonas and quorum sensing. Okay, I've got you there. (laughs) All right, another article on oral antibiotics for endocarditis. 
attainment of target antibiotic levels for oral treatment of left-sided infective endocarditis. A POET substudy was published in CID. Um, I mean, I know I'm back on the wards at uh, at Columbia because when I was uh, making my comments about the uh, Delphi consensus guidelines for much of endocarditis, um, the second year resident actually started to discuss the POET trial only at Columbia. Um, recently, well, maybe not only at Columbia. <laughs> Hopefully, I was say maybe elsewhere. <laughs> maybe not just that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Recently, a prominent clinician at a major academic uh, center, this was not Columbia or anywhere in Boston, I dare say, shared an article on oral step down therapy for endocarditis that showed superiority to oral step down therapy, same one that we talked about, then went ahead and commented, not a fan. I was a little bothered. <laughs> this is not sports. This is science. We're not fans. Our listeners know well that I am not a fan of eminence-based medicine, which involves making the same mistakes with increasing confidence over an impressive number of years, while the eminent physician's white hair and balding create the so-called halo effect, and the luminometer can measure the optical density produced by the radiance of this <laughs> fine white hair. Show me the science, and here the authors do. In the poet... Partial oral endocarditis treatment trial. Oral step down therapy was non inferior to full length intravenous antibiotic administration. Now, the aim of the present study was to perform pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic analyses for oral treatments of infecto endocarditis to assess the probabilities of target attainment. I can think of a lot of uh, clinical. Uh, pharmacists that are very excited about this, but plasma concentrations of oral antibiotics were measured at day one and five. Minimal inhibitory concentrations, MICs, were determined for the bacteria causing infective endocarditis, so strep, staph, and orcoxi. Pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic targets were predefined according to literature using time above MIC or the ratio of area under the curve to MIC. Population pharmacokinetic modeling and pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic analyses were done for amoxicillin, dicloxacillin, linazolid, which by the way is now generic and not that expensive, moxifloxacin and rifampicin, and uh, PTAs were calculated. What are those PTAs? Probabilities of target attainments. Enough with the three-letter acronyms. A total of 236 patients participated in this POET substudy for amoxicillin and linazolid. Um, as expected, I will say, the PTAs, the probability of target attainment, were 88% to 100%. For moxifloxacin and rifampicin, Again, I will say, as expected, the PTAs were 71 to 100%. Now, using a clinical breakpoint for staff, the PTAs for dicoxacillin were only 9 to 17%. So patients with sub-target levels were compensated by the administration of two different antibiotics. So, all right. Interesting. You know, I have, <laughs> I have to do Journal Club coming up, and I should just open it and just pick an article and say, not a fan. <laughs> yep, not a fan. Nope, go something, ahead, something. discuss. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my next paper is relatively quick. It's uh, from OFID, Utility of PCR versus Serology-Based Testing in Immunocompromised Patients with bartonella hensile Infection. Uh, so Bartonella diagnosis can be challenging. And we also know that immunocompromised patients can have misleading serologies compared to their immunocompetent counterparts. Uh, the authors uh, for this paper suggested that PCR testing from tissue or blood be preferenced or used in addition to serology in immunocompromised hosts and provided three cases of disease that they had uh, seen. Two were solid organ, and one was a patient living with HIV. They also provided a quick summary of the series that have looked at the use of Bartonella PCR in immunocompromised hosts. So it's it's a very quick read. Um, PCR testing for Bartonella is, I think we all agree, is definitely useful for tissue and, um, you know, how to use PCR testing from blood is sometimes hard to know. It probably is not useful in most routine evaluations, but if you used it selectively in, in an immunocompromised patient that you have a high clinical suspicion for, it you know might be useful. Uh, this actually came up when I was on service recently and you know when do we really need to get the PCR from the blood and how it's just not that great a test, but if you can't rely on serology, then 
you're kind of stuck. So that sounds like pretty much everything that we do <laughs> in immunocompromise you know, ID. We just uh, do our best. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> the article using source associated mobile genetic elements to identify zoonotic extra intestinal E. coli infections was recently published in the journal One Health and seems to have gotten a bunch of media attention. So the idea that E. coli UTIs, um, the concept that they are caused by foodborne E. coli, was actually proposed as early as the 1960s and suggested as an explanation for both, you ready for this, UTI outbreaks and sporadic cases. UTI outbreaks? There could be UTI outbreaks? What's going on? Well, first, I must say this is an interesting concept, that of UTI outbreaks. Um, It is a thing, and we usually only recognize them when we are seeing the same organism in multiple people with a concerning resistance pattern. As ID docs, often we don't even get called to manage those UTIs or pyelonephritis, and these folks get doled out to hospitalists or managed by their primary care folks, so this may even go unnoticed. Well, they performed this study at the Flagstaff Medical Center out there in Arizona, again, having just returned. Yes, right there on Route 66, where everyone goes to get their kicks. Using sequencing, they estimated that approximately 8 percent of human extra-intestinal E. coli infections, basically UTIs, um, in this study population were caused by food-borne zoonotic E. coli. They even have like a four-letter acronym, F-Z-E-C, of the f Zek. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Now, I am curious if vegetarians have 8% fewer UTIs. Actually, there are a few papers, such as the paper, The Risk of Urinary Tract Infections in Vegetarians and Non-Vegetarians, a prospective study. I will leave a link into that, but uh, that was published back in 2020 and did show a lower incidence of UTIs in vegetarians. But I will comment, they were looking at vegetarian Buddhist monks in Taiwan, so I am not sure how generalizable this is. Um, Well, I have two articles related to dexamethasone. The first is from France and the second one's from the Netherlands. And uh, they're, well, at least the first one is is one that I think probably comes up more for uh, the ICU teams that see these patients. But I think that we as ID docs are probably involved in some of those conversations. So the first one I have is from the New England Journal hydrocortisone and severe community acquired pneumonia. I'm going to say CAPE. Um, I'm going to say CAP. And the trial's name is CAPE COD, all capitals. So CAP colon evaluation of corticosteroids. So I've decided what I should do is start giving stars for <laughs> the trial acronyms. And I would have given this one four stars if it actually had any connection or involvement with the cape but uh (laughs) because of that they get three stars um so this is a phase three multi-center double blind randomized control trial of adults admitted to the icu with severe cap who received iv hydrocortisone so they had 200 milligrams daily for either four to eight days which is based on their clinical improvement and then followed by a taper of eight versus 14 days And they compared these to placebo, and the primary outcome was death at 28 days. And so the authors found that those who received hydrocortisone had a lower risk of death by day 28 compared to placebo. So at that point, death had occurred in 25 of the 400 or 6.2% of the patients in the hydrocortisone group versus 47 of 395 or 11.9% in the placebo group, which is an absolute difference of 5.6 percentage points. Um, A few other details, the median age was 67. It was about 70% men. The respiratory support at baseline, just as a breakdown, was about a fifth were on invasive mechanical ventilation, or 22%. Another fifth were on non-invasive support. 42% had high flow nasal cannula, and then 14% were on a non-rebreather, so that's about 8 liters per minute. Um, and so they found of the patients who were not already intubated that 18% in the hydrocortisone group required intubation versus 30% in the placebo group. And then when they looked at vasopressor support, 15% of the hydrocortisone group required pressors versus 25% in the placebo group. And they found no major adverse effects, although the steroid group used higher doses of insulin in the first week 
uh, which is not too surprising. So I, you know, tried to pull out a couple pieces only, I I thought it was interesting. Only about 13% of the potentially eligible patients were randomized. Most of them that were excluded were due to septic shock. There was a huge chunk, Um, but there were also a couple other things like if there was suspected aspiration pneumonia, if the patient was not meeting the severity criteria for the trial. And so they generally were excluding those sort of very severely ill patients, um, such as those on pressors. And then there's a pretty limited amount of immunocompromised host. Um, the other factor in this, the, as an ID doc, you know, the antibiotics were sort of left up to the discretion of uh, those who were taking care of the patients. So we don't have a ton of details on that. Um, but, you know, I think this is a topic that goes back and forth all the time. And I believe, unless it's changed the IDSA guidelines, I think the most current ones still recommend against steroids for CAP, whereas the Society of Critical Care Medicine, SCCM, recommend for them. Um, one interesting point, if you look a little bit closer, they they looked at the patients and stratified them by their CRP as well and did find that the steroid was most beneficial among patients with a CRP over 15 milligrams per deciliter, which I think makes sense. They have more inflammation. Um, But I guess my takeaway is not uh, totally different than what I probably already thought beforehand, which is that I think steroids probably are beneficial and the right subset of very sick ICU patients that don't have a contraindication. Um, But, you know, how much of the benefit is, is hard to say. And Um, But certainly in this trial, less people ultimately needed intubation, even if you sort of ignore the mortality question. So So you're going to say you're a fan of this paper other than they need a better title. (laughs) Yeah, there's. but you know what I didn't do is I didn't research to see if perhaps there is a cape that they could have been referencing (laughs) somewhere else in France that also is called Cape Cod. You know, I did not do my research to be fair. Yeah, another cape where they go fishing for the cod. Yeah. Um, All right. And then my second one that I thought was interesting and uh, I pulled is from eClinical Medicine. It's adjunctive dexamethasone treatment in adults with listeria monocytogenes meningitis, a prospective nationwide cohort study. So this was a prospective look at community-acquired listeria meningitis which actually counted for about 6% of their overall bacterial meningitis cases in this group. So 162 of uh, a little under 2,700 episodes of bacterial meningitis. They found that adjunctive dexamethasone was associated with an improved outcome. So if they, uh, they found that the dexamethasone, which was given at 10 milligrams four times a day, uh, at the fir- time of the first dose of antibiotics, that happened in 58% of the patients. Um, and then they continued it for four days. And then they sort of, their comparison group were patients who may have gotten DEX, but in some sort of different amount or who did not receive steroids. Their overall case fatality rate was 31%, so 51 out of the 162 patients. Um, and then there were some is listed as unfavorable outcomes that occurred in about 56%. Um, so I, I pulled this out because I think of steroids with initial antibiotics and bacterial meningitis as an intervention for strep pneumo. And I don't know that I had really thought that much about how there's guidance to hold it if you suspect that you have listerial meningitis. Um, and that guidance is based on a French nationwide cohort study called Mona Lisa, which gets five stars, <laughs> uh, which showed increased mortality in those who received DEX. And so the authors tried to point out some of the discrepancies that might have led to the difference between their study and this French cohort uh, Mona Lisa study, such as larger numbers of included patients to perhaps assess differences between the groups, and then different timing of the treatment, such as the steroids and um potential selection bias. So I, um, you know, these usually end with like, oh, it would be great if we had an RCT, but I suspect we're not really going to get an RCT for this question, but it seems like it's enough to say at least it's probably not harmful if the patient already received steroids or that you, there's probably not an urgency to stop it. Um, 
I did another for this one, take a peek at the supplemental information because a considerable portion of the patients who were found to have listeria bacterial meningitis did not get initial treatment targeting that bug. Um, So there was a pretty significant difference in the antibiotic selection. So for those who were in the dexamethasone group, 88% were on an antibiotic regimen initially covering listeria versus 68% in the sort of non-standard or never started dexamethasone group. So yeah, I'm oh, kind of lots of covering, lots of I'm kind of thinking covering the listeria would be better than not covering the listeria, but that's yeah, just it's me. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I I think and we actually did a febrile episode on meningitis not too long ago and we talked about this and how uh you know the the purpose and what we're thinking about is strep pneumo and I yeah, I had not really thought about it in the setting of listeria. It's also a challenge, I have to say, because you're supposed, the ideal is, right, you're starting that dexamethasone before the first dose of antibiotics goes in. So, you know, back in the old days, right, we used to actually just do LPs instead of like, I don't know what we do, but they seem to get delayed and delayed because no one seems to know how to do that. And then we would immediately get a gram stain. You know, it was, you could actually potentially get steroids in, but it seems that there's so many delays now with this, I don't know, the bureaucracy of medicine. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Are and I really, don't know if it's yeah. just where I am. I feel like we are not often part of that conversation, right? Because these are decisions made in the emergency room or maybe in the ICU. Um, and so by the time you see them, they're sort of out of that window of when you would have used steroids occasionally. I don't know if maybe people are called earlier in other <laughs> other centers than than I have had in my experience. Yeah, maybe this is a plug. Let's start telling everyone, call us, call us. You know, we love meningitis. It's exciting. I can hear all the ID fellows care. all over the country. No, we're not, we're not like those me. overworked optho f- folks who, you know, hate to get called after five. We love the 2 a.m. call with a potential meningitis. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and by the way, if you ever get the opportunity to go to Paris and see the Mona Lisa, it is more spectacular than you could ever imagine. So a little bit of a plug for the Louvre. All right, right. fungal. Um, wait, wait, isn't this where I say, uh, go ahead and watch The Last of Us? But yeah. anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the article, Worsening Spread of Candida Oris in the United States 2019 to 2021, uh, was recently published in Annals of Internal Medicine. And here we learn that the percentage increase in clinical cases of Candida Oris grew each year uh, from a 44% increase in 2019 to a 95% increase in 2021. Uh, colonization screening volume and screening cases increased in 2021 by more than 80% and more than 200% respectively. So from 2019 to 2021, 17 states identified their first C. oris case. Uh, the number of C. Oris cases that were resistant to echinocandins in 2021 was about three times that in each of the previous two years. Uh, C. oris has now been detected in more than half of U.S. states, and they they have this great map. Um, and uh, actually, number of C. oris clinical cases, um, and it goes from sort of this uh, well, the we're not telling you anything, no reported stuff, to uh, you know, zero clinical cases, at least one screening case, all the way up to between 500 and 1,000 cases. And uh, yeah, so uh, pretty uh, pretty interesting. Well, my favorite this week, I'm allowed to have a favorite, (laughs) um, perspective on the origin, resistance, and spread of the emerging human fungal pathogen, Candida oris, published in PLOS Pathogens. Just a few highlights, start with a little history. Candida auris is a major emerging human fungal pathogen that was first reported in 2009 as an isolate from the ear canal of a patient in Japan. In clinical microbiology, laboratory C. aureus is frequently undetected as 90% of isolates are misdiagnosed as, and I'm not going to read the whole list, but a whole bunch of different candidal species. Do you, you want to read those? You read those Sarah? Okay. <laughs> no, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, uh, now, the recently described global warming emergence hypothesis, I love this, suggests that an increase in global warming, if you believe in that stuff, led to the simultaneous emergence of thermal tolerant C. aureus in different geographical locations. Dare I say three simultaneous? 
because C. aureus is tolerant of temperature and salinity, Casadeval and colleagues have proposed that prior to being recognized as a human pathogenic species, C. aureus existed as a plant saprophyte in specialized ecosystems such as wetlands. In support of this hypothesis, Aurora and colleagues recently described the first environmental isolates of sea aureus from a sandy beach, just when I thought it was safe to go to the beach, and a salt marsh wetland in the Andaman Islands, India. The isolation of two clonal strains, one of which exhibited slow growth at 37 and 42C and was susceptible to antifungals, and a second that grew well at 37 degrees, that's a magic number, and 42, suggesting a close association with the wild sea aureus inhabiting the environment. Uh, I will agree with them. They, they say these findings suggest that C. aureus existed as a slow growing, slow growing and drug susceptible pathogen, which acquired thermal tolerance initially as a consequence of global warming and then developed drug resistance after its adaptation in humans. Overall, about 90% of C. aureus strains have acquired resistance to at least one antifungal drug. 30 to 41 percent resistant to two drugs, and about one in 25, about four percent, are resistant to all three classes of antifungals. Now, if this caught your attention and you're wondering how concerned you should be as you watch The Last of Us, I will leave in a link to a great paper from 2019 by, again, our buddy Arturo Casadevel, big fan of the uh, convalescent plasma on the emergence of Candida auris, climate change, azoles, swamps, and birds, published in MBio. Love it. Candida auris is getting so much attention in the press that I feel like recently I've had a lot of patients ask about it. <laughs> They're like, oh, <laughs> Candida? I, I heard about that on the news. And you're like, no, no, no. Well, I hope <laughs> I hope that is not, and that's not what's going on here. Yeah, I, um, I get the same thing. Like, I got a little bit of a cough. Doc, could it be the Candida auris? I'm like, Really? <laughs> it's in the differential. Uh, really low down. You know, if I keep doing that, then I'm going to be wrong at one point. <laughs> one day. <laughs> um, I picked one fungal paper for this episode. It's a narrative review from Transplant Infectious Diseases, Invasive Aspergillosis in Liver Transplant Recipients. Uh, so the incidence of aspergillosis in liver transplant recipients is low, 1.8%, uh, generally occurs in the first three months post-transplant, but it is associated with disseminated disease and high mortality of about 50% in most of those cases. Um, and so the authors go into some of the risk factors that have been identified before, during, and after transplant. Um, such as during with massive transfusion and the duration of the surgical procedure. Um, and then they pointed out some other information in there about the increasing cryptic aspergillosis species that are out there um, and the resistance of aspergillus fumigatus to azoles. So uh, just like a nice summary and an overview. All right, parasitic, be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism. Uh, I will actually say the most recent... Uh, mystery case is quite challenging. So I'm, I'm looking forward to some folks uh, helping us out because I have to say it was not a slam dunk. I spent a lot of time thinking about it and I may <laughs> still be wrong. All right. <laughs> this week, we have the MMWR trends in reported Babesiosis cases, United States 2011 through 2019. Um, and are we, what, what are we thinking? Are there going to be more or less parasitic cases. <laughs> well, here we hear that during this period of time, U.S. Babesiosis incidents significantly increased in northeastern states, three states, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, that were not considered to have endemic Babesiosis, had significantly increasing incidences and reported case counts similar to or higher than those in the seven states with known endemic transmission. Mm. All right. And they've got a really cool map, I should say. And uh, we are now adding this to our tourist brochures. Come to New York City, where we have COVID rats and Babesia infested ticks and so much more for the infectious <laughs> disease aficionado. <laughs> um, speaking of ticks, I pulled an article from OFID about multiplex high definition PCR assay for diagnosis of tick borne infections in children. Uh, this was a multi-center prospective cohort of children seen in eight, uh, what is called the PD Lyme Nat EDs, even though I am in this area, I did not know that this um, group existed. Um, so they took a look at those children who are undergoing 
evaluation for Lyme disease in endemic areas. About 600 of the samples were sent for this multiplex abbreviated HD-PCR tick-borne pathogen panel, which I did not know existed. Uh, So I went to the website and pulled up. So it's Anaplasma Borrelia, but it's Miyamoitoi. There's Borrelia Group 1, which is Bergdorferi and Mayoni. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And then group two, which is the relapsing um, Borrelias like Borrelia parkeri. And then they have uh, three species of Ehrlichia, Arachetsia, and then Babesia. And so of a little under 300 HDPCR panels that were performed on children with Lyme disease, they found 12 children had a positive result for Borrelia. So 10 being in that first group, including Bergdorf free, which is expected. But then they had two that flagged as the relapsing Borrelia group. I'll come back to that. And then 15 cases of non Borrelia tick borne infections identified in children with, again, serologically or clinically confirmed Lyme. So a m- small amount of children who had non Lyme tick borne infections identified um, compared to these match controls. Uh, sorry, compared to none of the matched controls finding infections. Sorry, if I was trying to find the least complicated <laughs> way to say that, and I didn't do that at all. Um, so it's consistent what has consistent with what has been reported before. Borrelia burgdorferi blood PCR is not the best. It's not super sensitive to evaluate patients with potential Lyme disease because again, these were children that had clinically diagnosed Lyme. And then I thought it was interesting that there were those two patients who had the relapsing fever Borrelia that was ultimately they think misclassified as positive due to low concentrations of Babesia because those two children did not have any epi exposures to explain uh, infection with the other Borrelia. So, I, you know, I don't think this is quite ready for prime time yet. Again, there was no comparison to the gold standard for the non-Lyme infections in these children. Um, and so the authors conclude, I'll quote, our findings suggest that multiplex HDPCR or other molecular tick-borne panels should be reserved for children with Lyme disease with an atypical clinical presentation, immunodeficiency, or who have inadequate response to initial therapy. But I think in those settings, those patients are probably getting the specific targeted test otherwise. So I, I would assume that the hope with this type of panel would be a patient comes in to an ED in an endemic area and you send off this panel and we find out what's going on. But I don't know that this shows that it can accomplish that quite yet. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, the following article had me a bit concerned. Molecular evidence of widespread benzimidazole drug resistance in Ancelostoma caninum from domestic dogs throughout the USA and discovery of a novel beta tubulin benzimidazole resistance mutation was published in PLOS Pathogens. Now here the authors report that deep amplicon sequencing of A. caninum eggs from 685 hookworm positive pet dog fecal samples revealed that two common resistance mutations were widespread across the USA with prevalences of 49.7% overall mean frequency 54% and 31% overall mean frequency 16.4 for these different mutations respectively. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a little concerned. I have to say, like, I'm not sure how good people are. Like in the in the old days, the old days, I don't know when those really were, um, but there used to be like you got a call, you know, hey, have you given your dog the the worming medicine, the deworming medicine, and you know, go do that right now. How many people do this? Do they do uh, here and there, and only when you know my wife reminds me? Um, <laughs> you know, is this just a disaster waiting to happen? Hmm. Well, I'll round this out with our miscellaneous section. I have a paper from JID, Emphasis of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion on U.S. Adult ID Fellowship Program Websites in the Era of Virtual Recruitment. So I can summarize this very quickly. The important take home is that when they looked at adult ID fellowships, fewer than half expressed any sort of DEI language in their mission statement or had a dedicated statement or a dedicated web page. Um, so I'm just going to summarize and say that women and those underrepresented in medicine want a place that values diversity and a climate for that. And so uh, the authors are encouraging uh, those who can to figure out how to incorporate this. And that that is my <laughs> 
quick summary that brings us to the end of Puscast. As always, the references for the show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease Puscast at Apple Podcasts, also at microbe.tv forward slash Puscast. We'd love to get your questions, comments, and paper suggestions, so keep them coming. Send them to Puscast at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting the science shows of Microbe TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute or Parasites Without Borders at parasiteswithoutborders.com and click on the donate button. I'm Sarah Dong. You can find me on Twitter at swindong, at Febrile Podcast, or at febrilepodcast.com. I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at parasiteswithoutborders.com, on Twitter at Daniel Griffin MD, as well as on the other podcasts, This Week in Parasitism and This Week in Virology Clinical Updates. And as always, thank you for this most interesting consultation and allowing us to participate in the care of this most difficult and challenging case. We shall continue to follow along with you. Thank you, and dictation, and goodbye. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious. <laughs>